Hello there. Welcome to the Saroy channel, wherever you are in the world. And so much love to each and every one of you. I do hope you're doing remarkably well and that you've had a fabulous day. I'm doing fabulous, thank you very much. And don't forget the rules. You've got to go and get yourself that fabulous, quintessential, perfect drink. And if it's something that I haven't heard about, I want to know about it. But before we get started, don't forget to subscribe to the channel, click the notification bell and the thumbs up. And let's get started with tonight's story. Dear Sarah and all your lovely listeners, I watched my grandfather as his clumsy arthritic fingers unrolled the cellophane packaging of the thick chunky cigar, tossing it carelessly to one side, where it landed precariously in the large ashtray. He popped the cigar into the edge of his slender mouth, lighting up the end of the stump with his gold lighter that had been given to him by my late grandmother when she was only 18 years old. Theirs had been a serendipitous love story, the likes of which they write movies about, as without her, my grandfather always divulged that the best part of him was now missing, like an amputated arm or leg. The cigar began to smoulder, and he puckered his lips inwards to inhale and suck some of the aromatic flavours out, and finally he exhaled, and wafts of cloudy smoke permeated the room in a warm, spicy, aromatic smell that I found swaddled me in a cosy warmth. Ah, oh, now that is so good, said my grandfather. So, so very good. I could see his crinkled face, wrought with wrinkles that announced every year of his life that he had lived rather like the rings of a tree, suddenly begin to relax and straighten, almost as if the act of inhaling the spicy smoke had ironed out all his corrugated ridges, straightening them out like a clean white starched linen tablecloth. In my opinion, my grandfather was old, very old indeed, and as old as some of the trees that graced the woodgrove that fringed every corner of his miner's rustic cabin that had been built in 1885. He adamantly assured me that some of those trees had been there since he was a boy, which would almost certainly make them considerably ancient. I could only marvel at this astonishing, mind-blowing revelation. Could anything be older than my grandfather, I wondered? The entrenched wizened furrows on his face cruelly betrayed his advancing age, and his handsome cornflower blue eyes were framed by a pair of opaque glasses, as over the years his dwindling eyesight had withered like the pretty wild flowers in the meadow at the end of the day. He looked good for his age. Well, so I'd been told by my mother. He was very willowy, but still athletic and lean, and his leathery sun-baked skin very weathered and rugged a tell-tale reminder from his outdoorsy life, where he'd spent tireless hours in the great outdoors, enjoying the fruits of his labours from his hunting, shooting and fishing expeditions. What my grandfather did not know about the natural world was not worth knowing at all. It really was as simple as that. I looked on him in awe and wonder, like you might admire a Picasso painting at an illustrious art gallery for in my eyes and opinion, my grandfather was infinitely more superior than some of the greatest masters that graced the covers of our history books, for he was my quintessential hero, and that is what really counted. I had begged my mother to let me stay with my gramps, and persuasion had been as arduous as a tempestuous sea, but my nagging had finally worn my mother down like a waterfall eroding the rock face, and she had relented and given in like a helium balloon devoid of gas, withering away and finally deflating. She had wanted me to accompany her to my Aunt Hilda's home in Nantucket for the summer holidays, which is an elbow-shaped island thirty miles from Cape Cod by ferry, blessed with stunning lighthouses, exquisite beaches, foggy weather and flat open countryside. I didn't want to be there, as Aunt Hilda, who had never had any children of her own, treated me with the disdain and disapproval of a strict authoritarian headmistress. If I had done anything to annoy her, she would beat the edge of my fist with the end of her wooden spoon, and glare at me defiantly with her hostile brown eyes that were cold and dispassionate. She would say, "'Off with you now, Nathan! The dreadful sight of you makes my hair curl!' There'll only be bread and milk for dinner tonight because you've misbehaved atrociously. I'm very disappointed with you, young man. True to her word, she would bring me a tray of bread and milk and lock me away in the confines of my own bedroom until the following morning, giving me all but a bedpan for my ablutions. 
In the morning, when she finally picked up my bedpan, she would deliberately wrinkle up her nose in disgust, as if she suspected the contents of my pan to be quite repulsive. I could always detect a gratified glimmer of pleasure in her eyes, as if in some way reprimanding me brought her a great deal of personal satisfaction. She made no secret of the fact that she simply despised children, and yet like a clockwork clown, my mother brought me here religiously for every single summer holiday. Why? I couldn't even imagine. The worst part of it all is that my mother turned a blind eye to Aunt Hilda's regimental regimes of control and discipline, without raising any objections. Perhaps she was secretly intimidated by her somewhat ferocious older sister. I had a sneaking suspicion that this indeed was the case. While Aunt Hilda just loved to exercise her authority, rather like a flagging, degenerating muscle in need of serious toning. My mother, who was a schoolteacher by profession at the time, working at a local school in Chatham, would regularly take the ferry with me from the mainland in Cape Cod, where we lived all year round, to Nantucket, where we spent our summer holidays with Aunt Hilda. My father would remain at home, tethered to his scientific laboratory, in the back of the yard or at the university. He was often labelled by many as the mad scientist, who looked as if one of his scientific experiments had gone awry for his white hair stood up on edge like a spiky hedgehog, almost as if he'd experienced some kind of an electric shock during an explosive experiment, upon which his hair had fully paid the consequences, for even hot irons could not straighten those punky spikes out. I suppose it gave him a trendy look that was approved of by many of his science students at the university. Growing up, he was never around for us, as being a staunch workaholic, he perceived that spending time relaxing on a sandy beach was a catastrophic waste of time, invaluable lost expended energy that could have been so much better served learning, studying or experimenting. My father did not understand the modern concept of family holidays, nor did he identify with any form of relaxation whatsoever. He quite literally lived to work and for him the world of scientific experiments outweighed the mundane drudgery of everyday life, and he would while away the long hours in the laboratory, sometimes for days at a time, with test tubes and beakers. So here I was in West Virginia with my gramps, a solid twelve hours driving distance from Cape Cod, and the wider the distance from that venomous aunt of mine, the better, I thought happily, with a smug sense of satisfaction on my face. I was thinking about how disappointed Aunt Hilda would be not to have me around to bully any more. She would really miss that a lot. I could see that my grandfather was dozing off on the settee, rather reminding me of a sizable walrus basking on the sandy beach, making those grunts, as his snores weren't altogether dissimilar. The sound was so amusing, it was hard to suppress my giggles. I tiptoed cautiously towards the large box of cigars, so superbly presented in a lavish-looking ornate tin box covered in twee pictures. Each expensive Cuban cigar looked so impressively beguiling and temptingly irresistible. I glanced quickly at my grandfather and could see that he was definitely asleep. Would he notice if I pinched one of his cigars, I wondered? It was doubtful, and it was worth the risk. I quickly pulled out a cigar from the box and grabbed the golden lighter, darting out of the small wooden cabin as quickly as I could. How I loved and adored this cosy gem of a bucolic primitive cabin, constructed from dogwood board and wooden siding, with a double pit shed roof. It was one excessively large oversized room, with an outside outhouse as tradition dictates. It possessed a profane heater, an old-fashioned stove for cooking, a couple of cosy single beds, a large settee, bookcase, bureau, coffee table, cupboard, along with a large wooden table and chairs. For me, it was an indelible mark on the landscape, a provocative reminder of marvellous summers spent fishing, hunting, hiking and tracking with my grandfather on this extraordinary, rustic, unpolished piece of land that had been in our family line for so many generations. Formerly a weekend hunting and fishing retreat, my grandfather had now transformed it into his forever home and rightly so. I couldn't imagine a more spectacular place to live in the entire world where blending into the rugged landscape was seamless. I quickly ambled towards the lake, which was to the front of my grandfather's property, several hundred feet away from the cabin, and I sat under a very large walnut tree there, 
on slightly moist ground that felt pleasantly warm to the touch, almost as if someone had warmed it for me. It was a magnificently beautiful day, with the sunlight dancing across the valley in a bright golden haze, whilst the shimmering silvery lake reflected the maple trees that flanked its far side like a large mirror, that I noticed had masterfully also picked up the fluffy clouds and the azure blueness of the sky to perfection. It was so peacefully tranquil by the lake, and I could hear the chirruping birds imbue the atmosphere with their pretty beguiling bird song. My heart fluttered with excitement. This was my moment, the perfect moment I'd always longed for, a moment when I could taste the rich aroma of my grandfather's cigar and fill his shoes for a moment. Dare I try? I carefully slid the long, thick brown stub out of its packaging and trembled eagerly as my finger gently caressed it while I slipped it into the corner of my mouth. I suddenly felt so terribly grown up and incredibly important as I lit the cigar pensively with my grandmother's ornate golden lighter. It felt good, very, very good, as I began to smoke, inhaling in clouds of the aromatic vapour and then reacting adversely to it by bursting sometimes into fits of coughing and spluttering as a result, for the fine wispy smoke had aggravated the soft lining at the back of my throat. I looked up quickly, swivelling my head to the right like a discerning owl. I had heard something, but what was it? Something was coughing and spluttering like me. Whoever they were, they were imitating me. In a three o'clock position, I discerned a shadowy movement in the corner of my eyes that hijacked and stole my attention. To my amazement, standing only yards away from me, on a pair of powerful, muscular, human-like legs, was a Herculean-sized creature with an amused look in his deep-set dark eyes. I'd never seen anything like him before. The strange creature was copying my dexterous movements with his hands as he pretended to smoke with a make-believe cigar. His impressions were startlingly realistic and precise, including an exaggerated sequence of coughs and splutters, much like I'd done. This thing, whatever it was, was imitating me masterfully, like a phenomenal mine artist of note that would easily bedazzle Hollywood. But what was the strange hairy ape-like humanoid, I wondered? What was it? I don't even know how to describe my feelings at this point in time, as they were certainly twisted and knotted up, like a sailor's tangled rope. I don't know what I actually thought. I think I was too stunned to react, too amazed, really. I did try to comprehend the gravity of what I was perceiving, for this thing, this anomalous creature, certainly didn't fit into our stereotype of reality, whatsoever. What was it, then? I couldn't be certain, for it resembled a tall man, covered in long, very sleek, coal-coloured hair. But then again, he wasn't entirely human, either. He was certainly far too tall in stature and girth to be a man, for he was powerfully and very stockily built, with dense muscle tone. He towered at about eight foot tall and three feet wide across the shoulder area. There were aspects to his anatomy that bore a rather striking, remarkable resemblance to a mountain ape, most notably seen in its dorsally domed head, hairless dark leathery face, defined prominent brow ridge and deep-set treacle-coloured eyes. After a second of being imitated by this gargantuan-sized creature, my fear subsided and was expunged from me, like the squeezed water from a bath sponge. I sensed this warm-hearted creature meant me no harm at all, for he exuded a lively, congenial energy that was steeped in humour and fun. I threw the cigar at him playfully. He picked it up with his large, human-like hands and began to try and smoke it, as I had done. And after his first disastrous inhalation attempts, he was coughing and spluttering as much as I had been, and this time he wasn't acting at all, as the smoke he inhaled had certainly irritated his throat, more so than it had mine. He wrinkled up his flat nose in disgust, as if to say, Boy, that was nasty! But that had not put him off at all. On the contrary, he was enjoying himself as much as I was, and the experience was mutually quite bonding. The creature's expressions were so hilariously funny that I couldn't help myself but laugh and laugh, so much so that my stomach began to ache as the pain of the muscles twisted and turned around my abdomen, as if I'd done thousands and thousands of crunches. The trouble is when I rolled over with laughter, so did the creature, 
as it was imitating me precisely and so brilliantly, which invariably meant I laughed all the more. So you cannot imagine the pain my stomach was in. This delightful creature was a natural comedian, and as he held my gaze with his twinkling eyes, he threw the cigar back to me, and so began our game of tossing the cigar to each other, backwards and forwards again and again, each taking a turn to take a puff, and we were both becoming happily embroiled in our fun-filled experience together. All of a sudden I heard my grandfather calling me, Nathan, Nathan! My heart sank at the sound of his voice, which brought the game to a swift, unfortunate halt. I glanced briefly at the creature, whose expression visibly dropped, as though he was rather disappointed, but he seemed to understand my need to have to leave. I pointed towards my grandfather's cabin, and then sprinted back home, hoping that I would see the strange creature again, but not altogether sure that I would. But the hope hung in my heart like a child's Christmas stocking on the hearth, in eager anticipation to be filled. "'Have you seen my gold lighter?' asked my gramp. "'I could swear I put it down here after I had my last cigar.' "'No,' I lied. "'I haven't seen it, Gramps, but I'll help you look for it. "'It must have fallen off under the table. "'Maybe you dropped it.' "'You're a good boy, Nathan. "'Alas, my eroding eyesight is not what it used to be.' he said, unleashing a heavy sigh. I wiggled out the golden lighter from my pocket and surreptitiously dropped it on the floor, pretending to find it. Oh, here it is, Gramps, I said. It was under the coffee table. My grandfather chuckled. (laughs) How the heck did it get there, he joked. This aging lark. It's not for the faint-hearted, let me tell you. Your grandmother would kill me from beyond the grave if I lost this precious lighter. It's even got my name engraved on it. Look, he said, showing it to me proudly. It read, To my beloved Marcus, from your forever love, Christine. And so it was, Gramps and I spent the rest of that blissful afternoon fishing at the lake, which was an angler's paradise, as it was bursting with a healthy supply of fish. We managed to catch two large bass of equal size and a catfish. It was over the fire pit here where my grandpa and I sat on two Adirondack chairs outside the cabin where we baked our fish over the open flames and it melted into the mouth as we ate it. It was certainly delicious. Why did the fish at home not taste this good, I wondered, and we lived in Cape Cod for heaven's sake. It must be our fresco eating. That was where the heart of the secret lay. Gramps, I asked suddenly, inspired by a secret longing to find out more about the strange creature I'd seen earlier on in the day. Do you get large people covered in hair living here in Virginia? My grandfather's jaws opened in surprise, as if he couldn't quite believe what I was actually asking him. How do you know about the wild man, he asked me. Who told you about them? I assume that is what you're talking about. I didn't want to tell my grandfather about the strange creature, obviously, because that would invariably mean confessing to my duplicity. Um, well, I did hear about it from somewhere. I think I lied. Really? said my grandfather, looking rather bewildered. I'm not sure I would be forthcoming about an encounter with a wild man. If I'd had one and it were me, he said. Most people think you've been drinking too much moonshine if you lay claims to such a sighting. For many believe that the legend of the wild man is just that, pure legend. But poor old Jason Dover, he learnt the hard way, as the folk in town teased him relentlessly about his startling claims of having seen a wild man that looked to possess remarkable ape-like features. No one believed him, of course, not a word of it. The man was not from honest stock, so his outlandish story backfired on him. Even in fact, if it were true. Who is Jason Dover, Gramps, I asked. Jason Dover, said my grandfather, rolling the name around on the back of his tongue. I haven't thought about Jason for a very long time. May God rest his soul. So he's dead, I asked. He's dead all right, said my grandfather, lighting up a cigar and puffing the smoke in the air reflectively. Tell me, Gramps, I urged. Please tell me the story. I assume there is one to tell, I asked hopefully. You're right about that. 
One night, when Jason had slipped into Mr. Dyer's vegetable yard and began helping himself to beets, beans, squash and turnips, you know, that sort of thing. Well, he was pilferaging for his mother, plonking everything into a very large wicker basket that he'd brought along for the ride, so to speak. He then heard a crunching sound, a sound of chewing and snapping, and that was when he saw something very large sitting around the edge of the bed of carrots and chomping them. On first impressions, it looked exactly like a bear. But given it was a very bright, pleasant night and the prisms of moonlight bounced on the creature's hands, illuminating them incredibly well, he perceived that this animal did not have paws. It had hands. So he knew with a profound certainty that this creature was most certainly not a bear. By this time, he was fascinated and very, very intrigued. What was the strange creature, he wondered. In his haste to find answers, he abandoned his baskets of goodies and surreptitiously crept from one beech tree to another. As these trees fringed the edge of a woodgrove that spanned the borders of Mr. Dyer's extensive, very well-fertilised vegetable yard, Jason silently moved ever closer towards the creature and had a great view of him in the light of the full moon. He described a tall, lanky creature with the face of a human and a dome-shaped head covered in very dark hair, sitting in the middle of the vegetable patch, scoffing carrots, along with the green foliage at its ends. The next thing he knew is that a large pair of hands had grabbed him around the waist, throwing him over a pair of powerful shoulders. He described being too shocked to even react or scream, as the shadowy form that had slipped out of the darkness had grabbed him so swiftly and so inconspicuously that it was almost too surreal and too dreamlike to comprehend that this was actually happening to him. The creature glided with him, straddled over his shoulders like a large sack of potatoes, and her running was like gliding because it was seamlessly smooth, almost as if she was skating on ice. In a trice he was jolted violently to his senses in the horrified realisation of what was actually transpiring. He was overwhelmed with a vast measure of angst, terrified that this creature might harm him. But common sense ultimately prevailed when he realised that if the creature wanted him dead, he would have been a goner already, for this thing could have swiped him across the head with one fatal blow, and it would be over Godovers for him. He ascertained the creature was female, possibly the mother of the tall, lanky youngling in the vegetable patch that was eating the carrots. She must have spotted him spying on her little one and was naturally protective, possibly concerned that he might pose a threat. He described his abductor as smelling like hay or freshly mown grass, a very, very pleasing smell indeed. Imagine his amazement when the creature dropped him outside his very own car. She waited for him to open the door and to drive away. He said he felt as if she had literally escorted him off the property. Imagine his surprise to discover that the basket of vegetables he had left in Mr. Dyer's vegetable patch had been returned to him forthwith, dropped on his front doorstep the following morning, which meant that the creature even knew where he lived, knew the car he drove, and knew that the basket of vegetables was indeed his. It made him determine that these strange creatures may know us even when we don't know them at all. So they're like the invisible eyes of the forest that watch and observe our every move while we remain blindly oblivious that they're even there. Wow, that is an incredible story, I said. Do you believe it's true? Oh, I do, said my grandfather. I rarely do. You see, Jason Dover, oh, well, he was a man of few words, left school at 12 years old, not very educated or articulate, with a pretty abysmal imagination. This is a story he wanted to share because it was possibly the most exciting thing that had ever happened to him in his entire life. But regretfully for him, no one believed a word of it, but you did. Of course, 
Jason would never have made it up. He just couldn't. He wasn't clever enough to make a story up. I'm in no doubt that it was true. Why did he die, I asked. What happened to him? Oh, it was a dirt bite accident. Got flung over the handlebars, I think. It happens. And you, Gramps? Did you ever see the wild man, I asked. Not on your Nelly. Oh, I've seen signs that indicate that he's out there somewhere. I'm a tracker, you know, so I see things like that. I've noticed things over the years, like large humanoid footprints that were almost certainly made by the wild man. Then I've seen anomalies in the wood. You know, branches being dislodged and shaped into Pacific ways, like an invisible marking system that only the wild man would understand. So, yes, I know they're out there. Your grandmother saw one once, when she was out berry-picking in the woods one day. I do remember that. She said everything in the woods became airily quiet. The bird's song dissipated. She got the overwhelming sense she was being watched. Then something made her glance towards a maple tree. And there was this tall creature, completely covered in hair, just staring at her with such an intense fascination. But once it realised it had been seen, it glided away. Of course, when she told me her story, she kept saying, Marcus, it happened so quickly. I keep asking myself, did I really see that? But she knew that she had. But such a sighting is hard to get your head around. I visited my Gramps' cabin for many years after that, successfully managing to avoid those trips to Nantucket to stay with my Aunt Hilda until he died about 30 years ago. My family now own the quintessential old cabin that used to belong to my grandfather and carry on the age-old tradition of enjoying it for short holidays. I seriously regret to say that I never saw the creature that I shared the cigar with all those years ago that I now know to be a Bigfoot. I seriously regret that. These days I enjoy the same Cuban cigars my gramps smoked when I was a young boy. And when I light them with the gold lighter that I inherited and I open up the cellophane packaging and inhale the delicious aromatic smoke, I certainly think of the day I smoked my first cigar with a creature that I now know to be a Bigfoot. So there you are. That's my story. Wow, what a fabulous story. If you enjoyed it, don't forget to subscribe. Until next time, goodbye and good night.